Um, just a few updates before we get started with Grand Rounds. The first is that uh, the uh, Republicans developed with a, a budget for the state of Connecticut with a few defecting Democrats that was put forward to the governor, which included almost a million dollars in cuts to the Connecticut Mental Health Center. That budget was vetoed by the governor, launching the state of Connecticut into continued discussions about the uh, uh, future budget for the state of Connecticut. So uh, this is just a reminder to those of you who, uh, who wonder about whether it makes a difference to be involved in advocacy that, uh, that this is a time to let your representatives once again know how important the Connecticut Mental Health Center is to the state of Connecticut and what they stand to lose if they cut positions support for the mental health mission in Connecticut. Um, let's see, in terms of other news, <laughs> um, we have, uh, next week, we have Murray Steen coming from the University of California, San Diego. Murray is a real pioneer in PTSD research who will be coming to talk to us about he, a, a lecture called, he calls, Traumatic Mind Injury, <laughs> which should be interesting. And then the following week, our own Ivan de Raujo, who uh, is an expert uh, in uh, the neurobiology of taste and feeding and obesity. We'll be talking about neural circuits for hunting, feeding, and aggression, which should be really very interesting. Uh, this is based on a paper that came out in the journal Cell uh, that I think is really innovative and exciting in terms of how people seek mechanisms about food seeking uh, and, and the complex behaviors that get engaged and the mechanisms for that. Um, also, today at 11.45, I apologize, I don't remember the location, is Diversity Town Hall. Anyone? 300 George Street in the large conference room. Uh, everyone is welcome to participate in that, and I encourage people to take advantage of the opportunity to talk about the diversity issues. This, is a, this was a... a, a, a um, uh, uh, town hall that we've been trying to set up ever since Char the events in Charlottesville. Uh, but uh, there are a number of important issues, and I want to thank uh, Kristen Booty in particular for seeing this through to uh, having, having the session today. So um, we're, we are indeed fortunate to have a real pioneer in psychiatry health care with us today. Professor Jurgen Unitzer uh, from uh, the University of Washington is the chair of the Department of Psychiatry there and also um, a, uh, uh, has a position in the School of Public Health, Health Services, and in Global Health. Uh, and he's an affiliate investigator in the Kaiser Permanente Washington Health Research Institute. He directs a very innovative uh, program called the Ames Center, which is de dedicated to advancing integrated mental health uh, solutions. Um, and this builds on work that he and his mentor, Wayne Caton, the late Wayne Caton, uh, and others at the University of Washington pioneered now over several decades, which had challenged a fundamental kind of unspoken model about the way that mental health care is delivered. Um, and that was uh, exemplified, the problem is exemplified by our own faculty incentive plan, which was that when the department was founded in its early years, psychiatry care, psychoanalytic care, therapy, medication care was considered to be so precious, the vulnerability related to confidentiality, the concerns about that so high that we established a faculty practice which was based in private offices that faculty members rented in the community. We didn't, not only was it 
not a formal clinic, but it wasn't even in the medical center that psychiatric care, ambulatory psychiatric care took place uh, for people who had insurance or resources in the most private but also the least well integrated way possible. Um, what, what Jurgen and, and Wayne and others pointed us to us, both as a conceptual advance, was how, what a disservice that did to, the, to, to people who needing mental health care. Because that model essentially created a fundamental obstacle that many patients never overcame in terms of, of getting access to mental health care. And what they decided instead to pursue, and which we'll hear more about today, is what happens when you bring mental health care into the medical context and make it easy as opposed to hard for patients to access care and engage internists and other doctors as collaborators uh, in the treatment. This is really a fundamentally important idea for many reasons, as we've talked about often, that there just aren't enough of us to go around. Um, so if you combine the shortage of resources with the uh, with the uh, uh, barriers that people face in, in pursuing mental health care. It's not surprising that the majority of people who have mental health problems still don't get care for those problems. So um, uh, before I give Jurgen's talk for him, <laughs> um, uh, let me just highlight some other achievements and, and some of his background. So he got his MD at Vanderbilt, he got graduate degrees in public policy at the University of Chicago, public health at the University of Washington, completed geriatric psychiatry fellowship at UCLA and primary care psychiatry at the University of Washington. And he has been an advisor to the World Health Organization, the president's, um, this would be Obama, uh, New Freedom Commission, I presume. And um, he's worked with a variety of, of, uh, of, of organizations to, to, to transform, really, the way we think about mental health care. He received the Paul Beeson Physician Faculty Scholar Award. Many of you know Paul Beeson was a former chair of medicine here at Yale. And uh, this was from the American Foundation for Aging Research. The Jerry Clareman Junior and Senior Investigator Awards from BBRF. Jerry Clareman is a former director of the Connecticut Mental Health Center where we're in now. And, um, uh, and the Distinguished Scientist Award from the American Association for Geriatric Psychiatry, Research Award from the American Academy of uh, Psychosomatic Medicine, Senior Health Services Scholar Award from the American Psychiatric Association. So basically, if there is an award to get, he's gotten it and for good reason. So it's a tremendous pleasure for me, and I'm sure we will learn a lot from our grand round speaker today, Professor Unser. Uh, this, is your, this is your tea, I think. This is my coffee here. Yeah. Thank you. But you can have it. That's OK. Yeah, I, <laughs> You're going to lose a million dollars here. Maybe we should give you this coffee. Sorry about that. Uh, so I don't have any bad news for you in terms of what the Connecticut State Legislature is, is doing. It sounds scary, though. Uh, so thank you so much uh, for uh, the nice welcome. Uh, I, uh, it's a real pleasure, it's a real honor uh, to be here with you today. Uh, and I'm going to talk a little bit about this crazy idea uh, that John mentioned that uh, we could do uh, mental health care outside of mental health uh, a little bit of disclosure, as, as uh, John said, my day job is I chair the psychiatry department at the University of Washington. I also have appointments in the School of Public Health there. Uh, I do a fair amount of grant and contract supported work on the concept of uh, providing uh, behavioral health services in primary care and other kind of healthcare settings. Uh, I don't do any uh, work for uh, pharmaceutical or device manufacturers or other for-profit organization uh, that I take money for. Um, I'm going to do what they do in the military, uh, bottom line up front. Uh, so this is the summary of my uh, presentation. Uh, fewer than half of those who need mental health care uh, will ever see a mental health specialist. And this is in the even most highly resourced parts of this country. And uh, uh, the hypothesis, and hopefully we'll be able to show some data to support this, is if we 
uh, take those of us who are mental health specialists and we effectively partner with, integrate ourselves into uh, existing healthcare settings, primary care and other settings, we can uh, go after what we now call in healthcare reform language the triple aim, which is we can get people better access to care, we'll actually get better clinical outcomes, and we can do all of this at lower healthcare costs. So that's the, that's the, the story I'm going to try to tell you. Uh, so this is a little bit of epidemiology. Uh, there's a lot of very good uh, psychiatric epidemiologists uh, have been at Yale over the years, so I hope I don't, uh, you know, make it too simple. But this is uh, from uh, this is a try to an attempt to visualize uh, the one of the last big uh, national epidemiologic studies, the National Comorbidity Survey. Uh, these things have been done about every 10 years since the 1980s. Actually, there are studies before then, uh, but where people go out in the community and they do structured diagnostic interviews with uh, adults living in the community, and they find folks who have diagnosable uh, mental health or substance abuse conditions. Uh, and one of the things they do is they say, uh, so let's assume these are 10,000 people who are uh, in the National Comorbidity Survey who are diagnosed, living in the community, diagnosed with a DSM at this time for diagnosable mental health or substance abuse condition. And then they were asked, over the last year, have you had any kind of uh, care? Uh, for this problem. Uh, and they were given a whole bunch of options. Have you seen a psychiatrist? Have you seen a psychologist? Have you seen other kinds of mental health providers? And so on. Uh, and so if we are going to say these are all the people who live with a mental health problem either in Connecticut or in the United States or whatever, uh, one out of 10, 12% will say in the past year they've seen a psychiatrist. So who here is a psychiatrist? Raise your hands if you're a psychiatrist. Quite a few of you. Okay. So that's, a, that's what we can do. That's what we do. And I show this to my colleagues, and they're not happy about me showing this to them. But, uh, and this guy right here, this guy, he comes to Yale and he gets ketamine. <laughs> <laughs> sorry about that. He's better already. He so he's, he's doing good, but uh, sorry. Uh, uh, Anyway, so we, we, got a, we got a big challenge, right? So if, what did we, how would we feel if this was cancer? How would we say that of all the people who live in Connecticut, uh, you know, who have a diagnosed cancer, one out of 10 is gonna get to see an oncologist this year? Probably wouldn't stand for that, right? But that's kind of where we are uh, in mental health care. So now you might say, okay, there's a lot more than Psychiatrists, there are psychologists, there are licensed clinical social workers, there's chemical dependency counselors, there's lots of people who've had training uh, to take care of somebody who has a mental health problem. And if you take all of those people and you say, who has seen somebody like that uh, in the past year? That's where we are. 20%. One out of five people will see somebody who has any kind of uh, training to take care of somebody who has a mental health uh, problem. So again, if this was cancer, we would probably say, wow. Uh, that's just not okay. 40% of people uh, will say, I've had uh, a primary care provider of some sort give me some treatment uh, for my mental health or substance abuse problem. So, uh, you know, I'm a guy who is mostly a glasses half full kind of person. That's my sort of disposition. Uh, so I see this as a good thing. Uh, I see this as an opportunity. Uh, if you're a glasses half empty kind of person, you look at this. Uh, so 60% of people who are living with a mental disorder uh, will have no treatment whatsoever in any given year. Uh, that's a huge, huge challenge for us. A little bit more about access. Uh, so uh, even if you have good insurance, uh, very hard to get to see a psychiatrist, probably also true in uh, New Haven. I was in Boston at Yale, uh, at, at Harvard, sorry, the, the last uh, a couple days, and there is more psychiatrists in Boston than, you know, in Africa. Uh, and Africa has a billion people. Uh, and they kept complaining to me about they couldn't get anybody to see a psychiatrist. So uh, it's interesting. So uh, this was, the first one is a nice little study that they did. It was published in Psychiatric Services a couple years ago where they sort of did secret shopper calls. They had somebody say, I have good Blue Cross insurance. I have depression. I need to go see a psychiatrist. Uh, and they called psychiatrists' offices in four cities, Chicago, Houston, I don't remember what the other two were, but big cities uh, where there are psychiatrists. And, and most of the psychiatrists said, I don't take new patients. And the ones who did said, uh, on average, it took about 25 days to get an appointment. So that's very, very uh, poor access. And this is for people with good insurance, right? 
Uh, and our colleagues in primary care know this. Uh, there was a very nice study. It's now about 10 years old, but I doubt it's changed very much. It was published in Health Affairs where they went into 60 U.S. communities and they asked primary care providers about their uh, satisfaction with an access to specialty care for their patients. Uh, uh, it was a lot of primary care providers that were asked these questions, and uh, psychiatry sort of rock bottom. Uh, you know, two thirds of these uh, primary care providers said, "I have no help from psychiatry, or you know, if I need to get somebody seen by a mental health specialist, it's really, really challenging." Uh, if you are a person living with a substance abuse problem, uh, this is even more complicated. About one out of ten people who live with uh, and a diagnosable uh, substance abuse addiction problem will actually see a substance abuse specialist of any sort. Uh, so I have two cartoons. This is one of them. I don't know if you can read this in the back. It says, we couldn't get a psychiatrist, but perhaps you'd like to talk about your skin. Dr. Perry here is a dermatologist. So, so I was, a couple years ago, uh, we're in a very large academic healthcare system. We have a lot of, uh, we have a bunch of community hospitals with a whole bunch of primary care practices that belong to our uh, UW Medicine academic healthcare system. And I was uh, doing a lunch talk uh, for folks in one of our primary care clinics where I'm trying to make the argument to them that they ought to have a psychiatrist in their clinic one or two days a week. And I tell this story and I show this slide and uh, the uh, woman who's the medical director of this clinic said, hey, not so fast. She said, we have a dermatologist here in the clinic and we love this man. Uh, you know, he comes here two days a week and we'd like to have him five days a week. And our patients love this man. And you know, by the way, she said, you know, when you're feeling good, when you're looking good, you're feeling good. Uh, so don't, don't say that this guy couldn't do things that are good for your <laughs> mental health. Uh, and I'm, I'm like, okay, okay. And she said, and by the way, nobody's ever asked for a psychiatrist. They want more of that dermatologist. So I said, okay. And there was an older internist sitting in the back of the room eating his sandwich. And he said, yeah, he's going to look good going down. Uh, so I, I, I hope I haven't offended anybody uh, too much, but we really have huge problems in access uh, in mental health care. So now you might say, how could this be? There are so many of us who are trained to be mental health care professionals. We have psychiatrists, and you can be you know, an MD or a DO and become a psychiatrist. We have psychologists. We have psychiatric nurses and nurse practitioners. We have social workers. We have a whole raft. Every state has a whole raft of licensed counselors and all of us together, we just get to see you know, one out of five people who, who is in need. Uh, how is this going to, what are we gonna do here? A little bit about the mental health workforce. So we are uh, certainly in psychiatry. We are probably outside of plastic surgery, uh, the most poorly distributed uh, medical workforce. We are highly concentrated in a couple of urban areas. In my state, uh, there's about 650 some uh, practicing psychiatrists and 300 of them are in our department uh, you know, in Seattle. Uh, and not all of them are seeing patients. Uh, so uh, we are maybe not uh, a population health solution. Uh, more than half the counties in the United States don't have a single practicing psychiatrist or psychologist. Uh, where we are in the Pacific Northwest, we are the uh, we are the only psychiatry department uh, for a five-state region that covers about 27% of the landmass of the United States up in the Pacific Northwest, and well over two-thirds of the counties don't have a single a psychiatrist, psychologist, or social worker. So there's huge uh, maldistribution. Uh, and if you look at the psychiatry workforce, about half of us uh, are 60 years and older. Uh, we're not getting any younger, and we're not actually replenishing uh, psychiatry to even keep up uh, with the population increase. So we are, we are not going to be a population level answer. So then I'm gonna talk a little bit about what do we do with our time? So when I was a resident, uh, I learned something called the 50 minute hour. So they taught us how to get in a room with a patient and you know, make a nice relationship and do an assessment and make a treatment plan and, and make it a follow-up appointment and, and, uh, and hopefully we can do that in 50 minutes because then we have to go maybe go to the bathroom, have a cup of coffee and then we have the next 50 minute hour. Uh, and our residents are still learning that 50 minute hour and uh, they say to me, I can't do it in 50 minutes, I gotta have 90 minutes and I have to say to them, you know, you gotta, do, gotta learn how to do it in 50 minutes otherwise you might starve uh, or you won't be able to pay your very expensive mortgage. Uh, so what, what we did uh, at a in our research group uh, at a lunch meeting a couple years ago, we said, 
how many of these 50-minute hours do we have to sell? So we said there is 40,000 some practicing psychiatrists in this country. Let's assume everybody is seeing patients, back-to-back -back patients for 30, uh, 32 hours a week. Uh, so that's not everything else, just, just pure patient contact. Let's assume that 3% of the U.S. population has the kind of mental health or substance abuse problem where you'd like to be able to be seen by a psychiatrist once a month. That's actually, those are some very conservative assumptions. Uh, and then let's see how many, how much time we could give everybody once a month. So if you're living in an urban part of the United States, you know, we could give you six minutes once a month. If you're living in the rural United States, we got a minute and a half. If you live in China, it's about 45 seconds. If you live in Nigeria, it's about eight seconds. Uh, just dividing the number of psychiatrists, seeing patients, you know, nothing but seeing patients 30, 32 hours a week. Uh, into that 3% uh, of the population who could benefit from a psychiatrist. So it's incredibly important that we learn how to do this 50-minute hour. I don't want to knock that, uh, but it's also not a population health uh, solution. We've got to think about something else. Uh, a little bit about quality of care. So there are about 30 million people a year, and this is a big change from when I started in practice who walk out of a primary care doctor's office with a prescription for some kind of psychiatric medication uh, in any given year. That's a lot of people. That's almost 10% uh, of the US population. In fact, this is a country that loves to take pills. Uh, you know, we take more, we consume a little bit more than 50% of all psychotropic medications that are legally sold across the world. And we're a pretty tiny fraction of the uh, world population. And uh, if you follow those folks, uh, and we've done that uh, in a couple of different ways, uh, about one in four will be significantly improved at the end of one year. Uh, so again, I'm a glasses half full kind of guy, so I will say that's good. These primary care doctors didn't used to do that. Now they're you know, finding 10% uh, you know, of their patients that are saying you need some kind of help, but I think they're gonna need more help from us to do something that's gonna really help make more of a difference. That's where I think the opportunity is. So this, this is my only other cartoon over there. It says, of course you feel great. These things are loaded with antidepressants. Uh, that's, that's the country we are. Uh, and in fact, I read a fascinating story that uh, made the argument that you could learn about the epidemiology, ep epidemiology of mental illness by analyzing uh, neighborhood level uh, sewage uh, because we take so many drugs that you could go to sort of guess from the sewage, you know, uh, you know how, what kind of... Um, behavioral health load or problems we have. Uh, I'm gonna just make one brief comment uh, because uh, it's very easy for us in psychiatry as specialists to poke fun of our colleagues in, at our colleagues in primary care. I think they have tremendously challenging jobs and I'm gonna thank them uh, for this work to do. And we used to say, hey, look, they do this lousy care. You know, they don't give their patients enough time. They don't do, they just give them meds. They don't do this mental health stuff very well. And then about 15 years ago, people started saying, what about the people you take care of in a place like this? Uh, what about the people who spend most of their lives being cared for uh, in, a, in a mental health center because they're living with schizophrenia and bipolar disorder? Uh, and uh, what about them? So it turns out they're dying in their 50s. Uh, you know, most of us are hopefully going to die in our 70s and 80s. So these guys are dying. Uh, the average life expectancy in the Pacific Northwest for somebody who lives with the diagnosis of schizophrenia is 51 years. That's about uh, the life expectancy of people in Bangladesh and some other very, very poor, very under-resourced country. This is the single biggest health disparity that I uh, know of. And when you start looking at this, it's complex, uh, but a huge part of that early mortality is not from people committing suicides. Uh, it's from people dying from strokes in their 40s, uh, late 40s and early 50s because they've had untreated hypertension. Uh, you know, they're very overweight, they're smoking, uh, and they have things that a good primary care doctor would very much know what to do with. Uh, and we don't pay any attention to it. You know, uh, psychiatrists, I hope I'm not going to offend anybody too much, for the most part, once you're done with your internship, you might spend the rest of your career prescribing horrific combinations of psychiatric medications, but you're not going to prescribe uh, you know, even a simple little antihypertensive for your patient. You're not going to prescribe for that person who is living you know, uh, with mental illness, who is 300 pounds, who has terrible hip and knee pain uh, because they're heavy, and you say you should be more physically active. They can't move. They have so much osteoarthritis pain, and we're not doing 
basic chronic care management, uh, basic chronic pain management. They're saying you should probably move a little bit more. Uh, we're not looking at their feet. They have horrible looking feet. Uh, you know, they're simple stuff that's not rocket science that if we were able to do that, uh, we might make a huge difference uh, for our patients. And, and I have to sort of say, I feel bad about this because uh, I, um, you know, I, I sort of try to badger my faculty who are taking care of those folks with serious mental illness. Could we get, if I can teach a primary care doctor how to do, uh, you know, 20 and 40 of Prozac, maybe they can teach me how to do 20 and 40 of lisinopril. Uh, because if I'm not going to do it, nobody else is going to do it, and these people are going to have strokes when they're 48 or 55 years old. And, and, you know, for the most part, our psychiatrist is saying, hey, I'm done with my internship. I got away from this medical stuff. You know, I'm not going to prescribe a throat lozenge. There you go, buddy. Uh, and it's a challenge. You know, I do think we are physicians, and we have to really seriously think about that. That's actually not my talk. That's one little point, but I just want to say it because I feel like and there are people here at Yale and in other places who are really working very hard at saying, how do we solve that problem? But it's equally challenging, so we can't just say people do poor mental health care in primary care. Uh, we do very poor medical care uh, in mental health. Uh, this is a slide uh, in part to, to really give tribute to my mentor. Uh, as John said, uh, my primary mentor was a guy named Wayne Caton. Wayne was a, a, a CL psychiatrist uh, who uh, realized early on in his career that uh, there was so much untreated uh, mental illness in primary care, and he spent most of his career thinking about how do we help people in primary care settings. And he was a guy who was very interested in the overlap and the relationship of chronic mental illness and chronic medical illness. So he did a beautiful uh, piece of work with a whole bunch of NIH funding over the years following a large cohort of people with diabetes, mostly type 2 diabetes, uh, uh, in a prospective way, uh, and he said, what happens to a diabetic when they develop a major depressive disorder? So it turns out uh, they're less likely to quit smoking. They're more likely to be sedentary. Uh, they're more likely to be obese. They're 50% uh, more likely not to be taking their diabetes medications the way they should be. So adherence is a huge challenge. And it's not just all behavioral. So this stuff, you could say, okay, I could get this if you're depressed, you know, I have all these changes in your health behavior, but there's a whole bunch of stuff that changes in your physiology. You have changes in your insulin sensitivity, in your autonomic nervous system. You have a lot of inflammatory markers and cortisol. And when all of that happens, what happens to your diabetes? You develop the microvascular and the macrovascular complications of diabetes at a much earlier age. Uh, you have much worse symptom control. Uh, people complain two or three times more about uh, the impairment that they have from their diabetes-related symptoms, so peripheral neuropathy, for example, uh, when they're depressed. Uh, you have a whole bunch of other complications, and you have an increase in mortality. Uh, and I think Wayne and I, we were psychiatrists, and I think we had our biases. We said we all knew all along that the mind drives the body, so we sort of looked at this going from left to right. It turns out, you know, our colleagues uh, in medicine uh, don't buy that. They say this is much more bi-directional because think about it. If all of that bad stuff happens to your body with your diabetes, how do you think that's going to work for your depression? What do you think that's going to do to your depression? This is the single best argument I can make as a clinician for why it doesn't make sense to try to treat the brain and the rest of the body uh, separately. Uh, this is the single best argument I can make for why we really should be uh, you know, fully integrating uh, our care. This was a really nice article, by the way. If you, it was a nice summary. It was in biological psychiatry uh, a little over 10 years ago now, but it's a really nice uh, synthesis of uh, some of the work in this area. The other thing we have is uh, we talk a lot today about patient-centered care. Uh, and uh, when you look at it, we're not doing a lot of patient-centered care. I grew up on a farm. I like these kinds of agricultural metaphors. These are silos. Uh, and, uh, you know, we have a medical care place, we have another place that will give you mental health care, we have a separate place that will give you substance abuse treatment, and then we'll have, I ran out of silos over on the right side here, we have places for social services, for housing, for vocational uh, services, for rehab services, and you know what, we spend a lot of money on these complex patients, but it's not adding up to very much. Uh, so, uh, uh, years ago, maybe about seven or eight years ago, I, I was taking care of a patient who had schizoaffective disorder, had seen this gentleman for a long time. He also had a pretty wicked cocaine habit. We got him off the cocaine. 
Uh, we were reasonably well managing his schizoaffective disorder. He was in a job uh, that was actually a pretty good job. He was in a marriage that was not a good marriage. He lost his marriage. He lost his job. He kind of fell apart. He started drinking too much. Uh, and I, I pulled out all the stops. I got this guy hooked up with all of these different kinds of care. And he comes in to see me one day and he said, you know what, this is incredibly stressful. I've never been this stressed in my life. You know, navigating all of this crap, you know, he said, you know, you have no idea. And I'm a person, I've got multiple graduate degrees. I can't figure out how to make all this work. So we're looking to people who are living with a serious mental illness, uh, you know, to try to navigate this stuff. Uh, and the guy said, and by the way, he said, don't you guys talk to each other? Because every one of you does the same thing. It all starts with something called an intake. You go in someplace, you, first you get a long wait, and then you get an appointment, and you go in and you get seen by some kid. He's probably referring to an intern or to somebody like that. Uh, and they sit down with a big questionnaire, and they'll ask you all kinds of questions, including were you abused as a child, and how do you feel about that? And I said, and I'm just trying to figure out how to pay my rent next month. Uh, and he said, and it's always the same questions. Two-thirds of these questions are the same, and, and they keep asking me these same questions. Don't you guys talk to each other? So I thought to myself, I thought, hmm, well, actually, we don't talk to each other because I don't have any incentive to talk to anyone else, right? In fact, as John said, we, we sometimes hide. Uh, you know, we'll say, you know, what we do is very secret, and nobody can know about it, and it's not in the medical record, uh, and uh, that makes it invisible. Uh, so um, I gave this presentation... So I think that's a challenge he gave me that I still think about a lot. I gave this presentation uh, in our state a couple years ago, uh, and uh, the Secretary for Health uh, and Human Services in our state was in the audience, and she got up right at this point, and she said, hey, she said, in my office, these are not called silos. These are called cylinders of excellence. <laughs> uh, and... And I, I, I laughed, kind of like you laughed just now, and, and I thought about it, and I thought, hey, actually, she's right. I work in one of those cylinders of excellence. You know, mine is, I'm in that one, right? That's my cylinder. Uh, and uh, I go to work every day, and I have to tell myself I'm doing God's work with these very difficult people, and it's very challenging, and, and I have a QI apparatus, and it makes us do it better every day. So they really are cylinders of excellence, but they are cylinders. Uh, and I think it often doesn't really work uh, terribly well for our uh, patients. So, so far I've used up an entire half hour telling you about problems. That's not super helpful. So let me see what I can offer in terms of is there something we could do about all this stuff. But the first thing I will say is I will take any opportunity I can to uh, train and, and retain more mental health professionals. We really do have a huge, huge workforce shortage uh, by any way that you look at that, and, and it's trained, but it's also retained. That's not such a big problem for a psychiatrist, but many of the people who are in mental health care are not paid the way psychiatrists are paid. These are difficult jobs. Uh, there's a huge amount of burnout and turnover, and we have to think about what is it that we can do to take care of each other so that we don't have such turnover as we lose a huge amount of our workforce in any uh, given year. Uh, it's challenging, so we have a very large residency program at our place. We have 73 psychiatry residents in our program. I go to our uh, government, our state government, uh, you know, pretty much once a year, and I say, can you give me some more money so I can train some more residents? And they'll say something like this. They'll say, hey, we're not going to give you any money because if we give you more money, what you're going to do is you're going to take five more residents. They're going to go through four years of residency training, and then they're going to go hang up a shingle, uh, do a small psychotherapy practice downtown where they're seeing a handful of patients for cash. From a public health perspective, these people are zero to us. They have no effect on the health of people who live in the state of Washington. So why the heck would we give you any tax dollars for that? That's a, that's a fair challenge. I uh, can't really argue with that uh, too much. So we need to do what we can to try to get more people into uh, you know, uh, doing this work. We also have to work smarter. I think we cannot scale the 50-minute hour. We have to think about what is it that we can do to leverage what we know as specialists, uh, either by collaborating with other people uh, or through technology. And I'll say a fair amount about collaboration with people, and I'll say a little bit towards the end about uh, technology. Uh, so the first concept uh, that I like to use is before I was in medicine, uh, early in my career, I was doing some work with the World Health Organization, uh, and we were doing refugee uh, processing, refugees who needed to move from one country to another. 
Uh, and they had medical needs. So for example, you had to make sure they didn't have tuberculosis because you know, if you spread TB from one place to another, that's not such a good thing. So um, we were in places there were no doctors. There was nobody uh, you know, to read an x-ray. There was nobody really to, to do what you would like to have uh, to treat uh, serious infectious diseases. So we would sit around and say, what, if, what would we do if we had a doctor here? What would that person do? Well, they would get an x-ray, they would read the x-ray, they would order medicines, they would make sure that the patient take the medicines every day. Uh, you know, they were doing some of the early work on directly observed treatment at the time. You know, who can do that? Well, we'd have to give people food so they show up, so they get pills every day. And we used the concept that the WHO still uses called task sharing. They said, you're not going to have enough specialists, so maybe you don't have any. So who all else can be helpful? So uh, we'd like to think of it from the top down. We say, we got a lot of money in mental health tied up in hospitals. We have more money tied up in community uh, mental health care. But as you can see, uh, that kind of specialty care only touches a very small number of people. Who all else is out there that could be a part of mental health care? What about primary care? As I showed you, they're taking care of you know, two or three times as many people with mental health problems that we do. What is it that we can do to help them do that better? What about even uh, beyond that, what can happen in the community? So my fantasy will be everybody is a mental health provider. The patient is a mental health provider. You know, their spouse becomes a mental health provider. Uh, you know, uh, what, how much of it can I teach to the patient? How much of it can I teach to, uh, you know, a family member? How much of it can I teach to a community health worker? And then uh, we'll do what we can, you know, at the base of this pyramid, and then we'll see what else is needed. So it's a different way of really thinking about how do we get at this workforce challenge rather than sort of starting at the top and saying, you know, how can I trickle myself down a little bit. So that's a concept. The way that uh, uh, Wayne uh, taught me to think about this in a practical way is uh, what we do is we do something called collaborative care. And I'll tell how that works around this picture here. Uh, so what we say is uh, we have a primary care uh, provider that's, uh, this guy is an internist, he could be a family doctor, he could be a, a, a nurse practitioner. Uh, and uh, he is a patient who is depressed, and what we do is we train a, a staff member in his office uh, who we call a mental health care manager. This happens to be an RN. Uh, it could be a social worker. It could be a psychologist. It could be any number of people who are willing to learn about how to do basic care for uh, mental health conditions. Uh, we teach them to measure outcomes. So every single time the patient comes in, this is Cora, was a nurse, uh, Cora will meet with the patient and say, let's do something called a PHQ-9. Short little rating scale tells us how bad this depression is. Uh, and we're teaching Cora how to do a whole bunch of brief evidence-based psychotherapies. We teach her uh, motivational interviewing, not so much as a treatment, but really to help engage patients and keep them engaged. We teach her uh, um, a, a pretty brief behavioral activation protocol. It's sort of CBT without the C. Uh, we teach her something called problem-solving treatment, six to eight 30-minute sessions, uh, where she says, you come in here, and every time you come in, uh, we're going to learn how to solve a problem. And it's not that we're here to solve all these problems. It's to teach you that there is a way that you can do, uh, that you can approach problems in your life. Uh, and this is important because the doctor is going to prescribe you a little pill, and that pill is not going to change your life. It'll help you sleep better. It'll help you maybe have more energy, but you've got to make changes. And this is the big difference, I think, between this and 30 million people getting a prescription, because you've got to do something with that prescription, right? These pills don't just make us behave differently one day. Uh, the other thing we do is we track all of these patients in a registry tool. Uh, so she has a list uh, that uh, everybody in the practice who's got depression uh, is on this list. Uh, and she goes over this list, and then what about the psychiatrist? So on the bottom right is Mark Avery, my colleague, uh, who's one of our uh, CL psychiatrists, and what he does is he doesn't see all these patients. Once a week, he spends, he gets on the phone or on uh, telehealth uh, or in person with Cora, and he goes over every single patient that's in that practice whose PHQ-9 score is not improving the way we would like for it to. Uh, and then he says, you know, try this, try that. Sometimes he'll talk to the doctor about that. Mostly he works through the care manager. Occasionally he'll say, I don't know what this is. We've already talked about this patient now twice. I'm not sure that we got the diagnosis right. I should see this person. And he's got a little camera on the top of his computer there. And this is a clinic that he works with that might be a couple hours away. So he says, put the patient on the camera. And the care manager gives the patient an iPad. 
uh, in an exam room somewhere in a primary care clinic and says, here is the doctor at the university. And what he does is not your traditional you know, 50 minute uh, eval. He might take 15, 20 minutes asking some very focused questions to say, is this you know, bipolar uh, two? Uh, maybe we're not dealing with simple depression. Maybe there's some other diagnostic issue. Maybe there is you know, a family issue that hasn't really been addressed. And, and you know, has a better sense of what is it that might make a difference and goes back to the doctor and says, try this other thing. So that's uh, how collaborative care uh, works. And uh, when we trial this, it looks something like this. This is a very large study, uh, 1,800 uh, depressed patients uh, that we put in the IMPACT trial. Uh, and we said, let's see how well this works. So uh, we had uh, eight healthcare organizations in five states. Uh, in every one of those organizations, we took 200 patients with uh, major depression uh, in a skid level major depression and on average three or four chronic medical illnesses uh, and half of them got randomly assigned to get uh, usual care, that's the blue bars, and half of them got randomly assigned to get uh, this kind of collaborative care. And usual care was we said to the patient, you have major depression, we said to the doctors, this patient has major depression, do anything you can over the next 12 months to try to improve that. So 70 5% roughly of the usual care patients got a prescription for an antidepressant medication from their primary care doctor. 25% were referred to specialty mental health care. So this is not a placebo group or a non-treated group. These are people who were kind of enhanced usual care because we diagnosed them all and we told them all to get care. And the other half, same doctor, uh, we said, you're going to have a care manager. We're going to use a protocol to try to track this PHQ-9. If it doesn't get better, we're going to keep changing your meds, or we're going to use some of these behavioral interventions, and a psychiatrist will talk once a week about the patients who are not improving. So a year out, uh, what was the treatment response rate? So this is defined as a 50% or greater improvement in depression symptoms at 12 months. Uh, which is a pretty standard outcome measure for you know, depression treatment uh, research. So what you can see here is on average, there's a little variation, but about one out of five people, 19% of the patients in usual care had a significant improvement in their depression. Uh, and just about 50% had that same level of improvement with usual care. Now it's interesting, same doctors, same clinics, uh, same medications. We use no. We didn't use any kind of experimental treatments. We just used available antidepressants. We just used them differently. We adjusted them a lot more often. Uh, we provided uh, more <laughs> more evidence based behavioral interventions, uh, and we didn't sit on treatment uh, too long. A lot of what happened in these usual care patients, they were all on treatment, but they might start on an antidepressant, and a year later they're still taking the same pill, and they're saying, "Well, I guess this is as good as I'm going to be. I'm taking a pill for my depression." which is a terrible message, really, to send to your patients. Um, we also found that this is not only going to make you feel good, uh, this might improve your physical functioning. We had very significant improvements in physical functioning, uh, whereas in the usual care group, we actually had a, gr a gradual decline in physical functioning. Uh, we looked at a whole bunch of other outcomes. There's a lot of papers from this study. I'm just going to try to summarize it briefly. We found that people had better access to care. Uh, then in a referral out model, uh, both the patients and the providers were more happy. They were much more satisfied with the collaborative uh, uh, option than with the referral out option. Uh, not only did we have less depression symptoms, we had less physical pain, we had better functioning, we had better quality of life, and we also found that we actually had lower health care costs. Uh, this is the data on the costs, which was not super exciting at the time because most people who worked with us at the time were doing straight up fee for service healthcare. And you know, when you're doing fee for service healthcare, those costs are someone's mortgage. That's a good thing, uh, right? Nobody's complaining too much. Now people are getting a little bit more excited about this. So, what we found is that uh, these were some pretty expensive patients uh, $30,000 used over the four years that we followed them. Uh, we spent about $522 for the people who got the collaborative care intervention. Uh, and then if you look at every single category of health care uh, costs that we uh, looked at, uh, we actually saw reductions in every single category. So for every dollar we spent on this intervention, we had about six and a half dollars in total health care cost reductions over a five-year period. Uh, the Wall Street Journal got kind of excited about this. They wrote an article about this in 2013, and this has gotten us more attention uh, than anything we've ever published in the New England Journal or in JAMA. So I would say to you, if you want to have 
get attention, don't publish in a major medical journal, try to uh, talk to the Wall Street Journal. The interesting thing is this was a story, so we're close to Manhattan here, so I can say this. This story was written by a Wall Street Journal reporter who was based in their Manhattan office. And she sort of was just mesmerized by the fact that you could get mental health care at a primary care doctor's office. In her mind, you had a psychiatrist and a psychopharmacologist and another kind of therapist. And you know, w the day this story was running, was coming out, uh, we had uh, a couple of press uh, interviews, uh, and she calls me and she says, I'm in my cab, I'm stuck in my cab, trying to go to my therapist's office, I'm so stressed out. And I'm like, maybe you should go to a primary care doctor. No. <laughs> it, it was very funny, actually. Uh, so there is a lot of research. So when you do something in research that works, you get more grants and you do more research. There are now actually now 80 randomized controlled trials that have tested this basic concept of collaborative care uh, you know, uh, for some population. Uh, many others have done these trials. We've done a lot of them. These are ones that we've been involved with. So we have now tested this with depressed adolescents and depressed diabetics and people with cancer and depression and people who have anxiety disorders, including PTSD, uh, people who have heart disease and depression. And every single time you apply this basic concept, if you do it well, you get better outcomes than in care as usual. Uh, Mayo Clinic uh, published a really nice little paper. They were actually not part of the original study, but they uh, they did a very good implementation of collaborative care uh, after uh, after the original research was done. And they did a, a study where they looked at 7,000 patients with depression uh, treated in their clinics, uh, and they basically looked at what happened before and what happened after they implemented. And uh, the article basically says it, it took about 600 days for your uh, patient before to go into remission, and after they implemented this program, it got down to 86 days. Now, that's an observational study. There are lots of potential flaws with that, but it, pretty compelling. If you like this uh, work, you'd like to learn more about it, uh, Patrick Kennedy uh, uh, has uh, developed an organization called the Kennedy Forum. They put together a really nice uh, summary of the whole literature on uh, collaborative care uh, about a year ago, so I'd recommend that to you for more information. I'll use the last uh, uh, 10 or 15 minutes to talk not about research, um, which is exciting and we're doing more research. We have a huge trial going on right now about uh, uh, telehealth care uh, in rural settings in three states for people who have bipolar disorder or PTSD. Lots more research that can be done in this area. But uh, the really interesting challenge for me actually the last 10 years has not been to say, to say, let's do one more of these 80 studies, but to say, what do we do to actually get people to do this? And that's been a lot more humbling than doing uh, large multi-site uh, trials. Uh, and, uh, and this is uh, where Wayne and I had lots of uh, really great discussions towards the end of uh, our relationship uh, where he would say, let's just do another study. And I say, we've we got to stop doing these studies. Nobody's doing this stuff. You know, we keep publishing in all these great journals. Nobody cares. Nobody's doing this stuff. And he's like, yeah, but if you're going out there trying to tell people how to do this in the real world, it's going to be really messy. And it is really, really messy. Uh, uh, so uh, we, we developed an organization called the AIM Center uh, where our mission is not to do research but uh, we go out and we have over the last 10 years trained uh, 10, uh, about a thousand clinics in how to do this evidence-based collaborative care uh, and we're looking at it from kind of a dissemination implementation research perspective. We've trained about 6,000 providers how to do this. There's a couple people, and actually Lydia Chwastiak is on there right in the middle. Uh, Lydia was here at Yale for a long time, and I'm very happy that we stole her from you. Uh, sorry. Uh, this has been my experience, 10 years of trying to do that. That's my summary. Very hard to get people to change. Uh, and it's not surprising. If you <laughs> not surprising. So if you give, um, if I get enough government money, uh, I can create virtually any alternate reality that, that I want to. You know, I can hire smart people to go into a clinic and do wonderful things. And you know, it looks pretty good. When you go talk to people who are running busy in their clinic and you say, now, look at these couple papers. You know, why don't you do this? They say, wow, that's a lot of change. Turns out it is a lot of change. So you know, it's not just going in and saying, here's a nice pizza. Stop writing for the little green pill. Maybe you should write for the little purple pill. That's a simple change, right? Simple behavior change. It's saying. You've got to have a registry. You've got to measure everybody on their PHQ-9. You've got to, your primary care doctors have to now treat people who have bipolar depression. That's challenging stuff. 
they're not happy about that necessarily. Uh, you've got to hire this person who is a therapist who's going to be in a primary care office seeing a lot of patients working with this registry. Maybe her sense of herself is she's a therapist and she likes that sign that says do not disturb. Uh, and every time she's in the room with a patient, she puts that sign on. And if she puts that sign on, she becomes invisible in that clinic, and it doesn't work very well. And I have to say, you've got to lose that sign. You're gonna, in a primary care clinic, it's not like traditional mental health care. You've got to be able to have somebody walk in and say, hey, I want to introduce you to my patient, and your patient is going to just have to make that work. Uh, the psychiatrists have to do totally different work, right? Uh, you know, we're trained to do these 50-minute hours. I'm talking to somebody saying, you're going to be on a computer with a camera you know, overseeing a panel of 100 depressed patients uh, in four hours a week, they're saying, whoa, whoa, what about malpractice? What about this? What about that? So there's a lot of change needed, and it's not simple to do change, uh, you know, outside of uh, research. So uh, we used to be kind of naive about this. Now we are less naive about it. Uh, so we, we, we have a pretty sophisticated uh, sort of change management approach. So when a clinic wants to work with us how to do that, we we engage with them in about a one or two year effort to try to sort of do a lot of, uh, before we train anybody, we do a lot of what we call pre-launch training. We say, what do you have now? What do you want to go to? What all else could you use that you already have? What would we have to change? So they really understand what the change is, what they'd have to do to really make a difference. Then we train everybody, and everybody has something to learn. There's none of us who really learned this in our training. And then we give them almost a year's worth of uh, what we call post-launch assistance, where I call in uh, to the team calls, and I listen to what they do when they talk about patients, and I say, yeah, you're doing it, or yeah, you're not quite doing it yet. You talked about three patients. What about all the ones on your registry who are not coming back? So we really give a lot of uh, coaching afterwards. Uh, we have a website. We have a lot of tools that we've developed that, that are up there for free. Uh, we've written a book about how to do this. Uh, how do you treat depression as a team? So what does the PCP do? What does the psychiatrist do? What does the care manager do? What does a therapist in the office do? Uh, what does the patient do? Uh, how do you treat substance abuse that way? Uh, we have a big grant, uh, and it's been a real pleasure, uh, from CMMI uh, that we do in partnership with the American Psychiatric Association, where we uh, have uh, set out to train 3,500 psychiatrists all over the country in learning how to do this kind of collaborative care. We're about halfway done with that. We've trained uh, a little over 1,500 uh, psychiatrists in, in how to do this kind of collaborative care. Uh, we are saying, you know, can you further leverage ourselves using technology? Uh, we have uh, one of our faculty, Amy Bauer, uh, has developed a smartphone app uh, that we use in our work, and so it allows people to do things like checking in. Uh, you know, you don't have to come into the clinic to do a PHQ-9. That thing could send you a text message, and, you know, you push a couple of buttons, and that goes right into our care management registry. It goes into our EHR, and I know that the patient is doing okay, or they're not doing okay. And then what I do is I call out. I don't wait for when their next appointment is. I say, hey, you're not doing well. Let's talk. Uh, we can text with the patient. We can call with the patient. We can show the patient. Uh, you know, uh, their progress. Uh, we put a lot of educational tools on these apps, uh, including some videos of patients who've been through treatment, who talk to patients about uh, what treatment is like. Uh, we make it easy for people to reach out to us. Uh, we make them put all of the contacts that they have that they like to be able to reach if they're not doing well uh, and make that uh, easy. Uh, and we put a whole bunch of other useful information about their, their treatment targets, their goals, their behaviors. Uh, and uh, this is kind of cool. Uh, we've done feasibility work. It's, it's doable. Uh, but I can't tell you yet how much of a difference this is going to make. We have a very large trial going on right now with about 1,000 patients in three states. And half of them are being offered this app in addition to uh, what all else they're getting. And I'll tell you in a couple years, hopefully, if this is actually making any difference uh, or not. Uh, we have, uh, um, you know, we do a lot of research, and I'm in a large academic healthcare system, and until 2008, uh, we had done 20 years of research, but we didn't have a single clinic in our healthcare system that actually did this, uh, because we would just study it, and then we'd go on to write the next grant, we do another research study, and so I got tired of that, and I started talking people into doing this in our own healthcare system, so we put it into three clinics at our county hospital, family medicine, internal medicine, uh, and a clinic that treats homeless patients. Uh, and then over the last uh, uh, 10 years or so, we have now put it into uh, some 20 primary care clinics where we have a psychiatrist, 
a care manager, a registry uh, on site in every single one of those clinics. So every single UW Medicine primary care clinic now can offer you on site fully integrated uh, behavioral health care. Uh, and uh, our uh, colleagues in primary care have loved this. I'll let you read this. This is uh, from the medical director in one of our uh, clinics. Uh, and, you know, people say, how do you sell it? Uh, so, you know, the initial sell was the research evidence is very strong for this. It's not easy to fund it yet, although now we actually have collaborative care billing codes that CMMI has approved. Uh, but the people who sold it for me were the primary care doctors. So we had it in four clinics. Uh, and they started talking to each other. And, and pretty soon they started saying, hey, look, if you don't put this here, I'm going to work in one of these other clinics or I'm going to go somewhere else. Uh, and uh, people really want their primary care doctors to be happy because they're the ones who are providing basic health care. They're the ones who are feeding us in the very expensive care that we provide in our hospitals. So our primary care doctors sold this. And within about a couple years now, we have it in every single one of our clinics. We have a partnership with the managed Medicaid plan in our state uh, where we have gone out and partnered with 150 uh, primary care clinics. Every one of those little dots is a community health clinic uh, in one of the counties in our state. Uh, and uh, every one of those clinics has uh, a psychiatrist uh, four hours a week assigned to it. Most of them are on our faculty. Uh, and they do what I just told you. Uh, they go over a list of patients. They might consult to the patient. They might see them in telehealth. Uh, and we track about 50,000 uh, patients a year uh, in a, a care management database that's on the web. Uh, most of them have depression. Uh, uh, many of them have anxiety disorders. About 17% have full-on PTSD. Uh, we have a good number with alcohol and substance abuse problems. We, uh, this is a bit of a surprise, 15% of these patients, so about 6,000 of them actually have bipolar disorder. And I used to think that's kind of where you stop in primary care. You know, that's where you're in specialty care. But there's tons of bipolars who are being treated in uh, primary care. 45% uh, of these folks have thoughts of suicide at the time they uh, uh, start this uh, program. So this is not the worried well. These are some pretty darn sick uh, people. Uh, we've looked at how well this works in the real world. Um, this is a survival analysis we published in the American Journal of Public Health a couple years ago. The blue line is when we first implemented the program. We trained 19 clinics how to do this. Uh, and the blue line has about 2,000 patients in it. And what we're looking at it here is how much time goes by in weeks uh, for 50% of the patients uh, to have a significant improvement in their depression. And uh, it's a lot of time. It's over a year. And we were very unhappy when I saw this because what I sort of knew from the randomized controlled trials, this should be a lot better than this. So I went back to this health plan and I said, look, you're paying these clinics for doing something. They're not really doing it very well. Uh, stop paying them. And they said, what do you mean? I said, well, what if you tie 25% of the payment for this to them doing one of two things? Either get the patient well, so the PHQ-9 score is low, or if it's not improving, because they could have all the sick patients, uh, show me that you're doing a psychiatric consultation and that you're changing the treatment at least every eight weeks. Uh, so this is the combating this notion that we have a lot of clinical inertia. A lot of us are sitting on patients, both in psychotherapy or on medication treatment, who are just not improving. We don't change anything. Uh, so they said, well, 25 percent, that's a lot of money. And the clinics complained a lot. And the red line is almost 6,000 patients who were treated after we put this pay for performance initiative into effect. <laughs> Same clinics. And what you see is we shifted this curve way over to the left. So now it's down to 24 weeks uh, for half these people to get better. Uh, we're not using more resources, we're just using them differently, uh, much more intensively consulting more with each other, making more treatment changes. Uh, we have a subset of this group, which is a group of high-risk moms uh, that are treated in 13 clinics in King County. Uh, we now have 2,000 of them, but this is the first uh, six or 700 of them. Uh, and when we first did this program, it took, again, it took about a year for half of these moms' uh, depression uh, to get well. Uh, and uh, after we changed the way the program works, we're now down. You can see this curve is way shifted over to the left. Now it's about 10 weeks uh, for 50 percent of uh, these women uh, to have a significant improvement in their depression. And if you're pregnant, that makes a big, big difference uh, if you're going to be uh, you know, seriously depressed for a whole year or, or less than that. Uh, I think that our colleagues who do this work really enjoy it. They are sort of saying, not only do I reach more patients, I do a lot of teaching. We have done a tremendous amount of capacity building with this effort. If you look at all those little dots on our map, 
there are primary care providers in every one of those clinics that are getting you know, 10, 20, 30,000 consultations a year. And these are smart people. On average, uh, you know, internists are smarter than psychiatrists. You know, I'm not saying this. This is, uh, Yale is excluded. Uh, but, but, you know, if you look at who goes into psychiatry, it's not necessarily the smartest uh, graduates from any medical school class. These are smart people. Uh, and if you say to them three or four times, you know, try something else, they'll start doing it. So you have an effect that's much bigger than just having treated that one patient, you know, because you may be affecting a lot of patients who are going to walk into this doctor's office. Uh, I'm going to make this uh, my last slide here. So there are a lot of different ways to do this kind of thing. I think there are a couple of core principles that are really important to kind of keep in mind. The first one is, uh, going back to my patient, this notion of truly being patient-centered. I think the patients, for this to work well, the patients have to feel that we are talking to each other. You know, that we really are paying to attention, not just to some subset of them, but we're treating their diabetes and their depression and we're talking together and we maybe even have a shared care plan. And, uh, you know, I'm thinking about the reverse integration stuff where, you know, if you bring in a nurse practitioner to a mental health center and they talk to the patient about smoking three or four times a year, that's one thing. Uh, if you have the case manager who sees that patient 40 or 50 times a year talk to them about smoking every single time, that's a huge effect, right? So uh, I think we really have to do this together. Uh, the second one is this notion of population-based care. You know, a clinicians train on numerators. Uh, so the numerator is the people who show up in your waiting room and they keep coming back in your waiting room and we do the best we can for them. That's what we do as clinicians. Public health people think about denominators. They think about who are all the people that should be in your waiting room. Or maybe they were once in your waiting room and they're not coming back. Those are the people that are in a registry. And when you start doing that, it gets kind of painful because you realize, wow, there is so much stuff out there that we started and we never really finished it. And so we really have to then think differently. Evidence-based care. We see still a ton of care use that, frankly, I don't think there is good evidence for it. Uh, so we have to do things that, you know, at least have some chance of working. The fourth principle is the notion of having a target, uh, treating the target. This is something I've learned in spades from my colleagues in primary care. You know, they are overwhelmed by uncertainty. They're treating people with all ages, all different conditions. And so one of the ways they manage that uncertainty, they measure things. So they measure my blood pressure when I go in. They measure my uh, blood sugars if I'm a diabetic, you know, and we don't measure yet, uh, you know, outside of research. You know, when you come in and I treat you for depression, uh, you know, uh, I start some treatment and then you come back and I say, how are you feeling? And you say, oh, you know, you're a nice person and I'm a nice guy. And you say, I'm a little bit better. I said, that's good. Let's keep, keep going. And the next time I'm going to say the same thing. Uh, if you treated my blood pressure that way, I'm a person who has hypertension. Uh, you know, they would have started me on a low dose of an and a hypertensive medicine. They would have said, you know, how are you feeling now? And I'd say, oh, I think it's a little bit better. I'd have had my stroke by now. <laughs> right? But that's how we treat in mental health. So uh, we need to measure things, and if they're not improving, we need to change treatment. It's not that we're a bad therapist or a bad patient. Just if it's not working, change it. If you do all of that, I think we really can live up to what healthcare would like from us today, is which really to be accountable for not just a handful of patients, but really a population of patients. I think I'm going to stop here. Thank you very much.